Looking at today's passage, I've wondered if you've ever pondered just how broken a human life can become. Now, we all know minor annoyances like having a bad hair day or having a co-worker speak to us in a way we don't want them to or getting into a stupid fight with our spouse or, or a child. But that's not what I'm talking about. Just, just how bad can it get in life? What does it look like when things are so bad we lose all hope? And where is God when we hit those moments? Today we're going to look at an encounter Jesus had with a man who was at the bottom of a deep, dark pit. And I think we're going to find that he looks for us even in moments like this. We're in John chapter 5, looking at verses 1 through the first half of verse 9. I've titled today's message, When Hope is Lost. Let's start reading verses 1 through 3. After these things, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is in Jerusalem at the Sheep Gate a pool called Bethzatha in Hebrew, with five roofed colonnades. In these were lying down a multitude of the sick, blind, crippled, paralyzed. John connects this story to the previous one in a somewhat um, vague way. After these things is all he says. He doesn't uh, give any more detail than that. So it could be any, any point of time after the things he just talked about. This miraculous healing is when he was in Cana of Galilee of a royal official whose son in Capernaum was dying. Uh, after that, sometime, there's another feast of the Jews. So some amount of time must have passed because Jesus was just now getting back from Passover. Um, Given the details of this story, it seems like it would have had to be a feast that happens in a warmer time of the year than Passover. So it probably isn't another Passover we're talking about here. But John never identifies the feast. Uh, that's not the significant aspect uh, he wants to point out about this event. But at some point in the future, after the events we'd looked at last week, uh, there's another feast of the Jews, and Jesus goes to Jerusalem for this feast. And we're told that in Jerusalem, uh, at the Sheep Gate, there's a pool called Bethsatha. Now, most translations have their Bethesda. Uh, there's some confusion in the manuscripts as to the spelling of this pool. Uh, some people like Bethesda because they can assign a meaning to the Hebrew there and, and of, uh, I forget if it's House of Comfort, something like that. But uh, the fact that uh, John himself never assigns any importance to the name apart from just telling us this is what they called it in Hebrew, um, I don't think we need to uh, worry too much about the spelling of it. There is this pool. Uh, it's called Bethesda. Uh, and it has five roofed colonnades. So uh, from archaeological evidence, uh, it seems that this was probably a pool that was actually two pools side by side. So you have a colonnade around the outer edge, that's four, and then one going right down the middle that splits it into two pools. So that would be the five roofed colonnades uh, around the pool. And in these uh, colonnades surrounding the pool are lying down a multitude of people who are sick, blind, crippled, paralyzed. In the Greek there, the word I've translated paralyzed is dried, withered. Uh, and it's more generic than paralyzed. We think paralyzed it has have something to do with the, with the spinal column. Uh, this word is more generic than that. You could have a withered hand or uh, any portion of your body that but for whatever reason, people who uh, do not have use of at least one limb uh, because of illness. Uh, this is a, a motley assortment of people. Now, uh, even today, there are people who don't like to go to hospitals because they don't like being around sick people. Uh, try to picture this pool surrounded by all these uh, sick people and add to this not just the, the, our sensibility today that uh, it's just uh, not the most pleasant thing to be exposed to illness uh, but think of antiquity where people thought that when people had a very severe illness it had to be that you had somehow offended God if you were a Jew or if you were a pagan you had offended some God and uh, it was seen as a sign of displeasure that somehow you had done something terribly offensive to cause such great misfortune to overtake you. 
there was not a whole lot of sympathy for those who found themselves in this kind of a situation. And uh, according to Jewish ritual, if you came into contact with these people, that would contaminate you ritually. You would become unclean and would need to go through purification rituals to become uh, able to go to the temple, for example, and do things like that. So uh, this is probably not the most popular pool in Jerusalem. This is a pool where people who are kind of outcasts, who are out on the outer fringes. This is not the kind of pool that the rabbis probably generally frequented. And yet that's where Jesus chooses to go. He goes to this pool uh, surrounded by outcasts. Let's keep reading. Verse 5. Now there was a certain man there who had been sick for 38 years. Now uh, you might say, what did we do with verse 4? Uh, verse 4 is not found in the most ancient manuscripts uh, we have. So it apparently was something that was added a little bit later. Verse 4 basically adds an explanation of why the man wanted to get into the water after it was uh, agitated or moved. And uh, this is probably something that happened in other similar uh, pools uh, where people thought healings took place. Uh, so some later scribe probably inserted that verse. Uh, that's why we're not reading it right now. But the idea being that uh, when the wind moved the pool or there was some kind of movement in the pool, they assumed that an angel had passed by and uh, touched the water. And therefore, the first person to get in the water after that happened might be healed. It's a somewhat superstitious approach, but uh, you're talking about people who are desperate. Um, and are, are willing to try just about anything to, to get well. So there is there, verse 5, a, a certain man who'd been sick for 38 years. Life expectancy at this time was somewhere in the 40s. So this man had lived what for many people would be a whole lifetime in his day as an invalid. Now, we know from details in the story that he wasn't born this way. That there was a time in his life when uh, he was not afflicted with this. And at some point, uh, this happened. And for 38 years now, that has been the reality of his life. Try to picture for a moment what that would have been like. Now, even today, nobody wants to suffer from paralysis or something like that. We know even today with all the accommodations that our society tries to make for people with these kinds of difficulties, we know that it's a very difficult way to do life. Trying to get upstairs is difficult. Trying to get into buildings and out of buildings and trying to get into a restroom and out of a restroom unless they've made great effort to accommodate you uh, is extremely difficult. And even then, it's not the easiest thing in the world. Well, this man lived at a time before all of that a time where nobody made any kind of allowances of this sort. There were steps, there were steps. You either walked up them or somebody carried you up them, but that was it. Think of a time where people thought that if you had some severe illness, you must have done something terrible, and God must be really upset with you. Uh, try to picture what 38 years of living that way might do to a human. Uh, he's, he's no doubt had a very hard and isolating life. Verse 6, Jesus, seeing this one lying down and knowing that he has already been there a long time, says to him, Do you want to become well? So Jesus sees him and supernaturally knows things about him. He just saw him for the first time. He just met him, but he knows this guy's been here a long time. He knows, he, in his mind's eye, he knows immediately of the 38 years stretching back for this man. And the pain that has accompanied that. So he, this is the one he focuses on. He turns to this man and has a very simple but very broad question. Do you want to become well? That's so much broader than just, do you want me to heal you? Do you want to become well? 
And I think Jesus asks this that broadly because he's not just saying, uh, I want to do something about your physical infirmity. He's saying, I want to make you whole. I want you to be made well. And this physical infirmity is one big issue in your life, but it is not the, whole, the totality of what makes you a broken man. There's a whole lot more to your story than just this illness. Do you want to become well? I have a question for you from this. Consider Jesus' question to the man at the pool. Do you want to become well? How do you think Jesus would define well in your life? Let's keep reading, verse 7. The one who was sick answered, Lord, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water should stir, but while I am going down, another person goes down before me. There's the idea that when the water stirs, you have to be the first one to get into the water for anything to happen. And uh, Jesus says simply, do you want to become well? The man's answer is, I can't. He doesn't say, yeah, would you help me? Could you stick around and when you see the water move, would you help me get there? He doesn't even entertain that as a possibility. All he does is explain to Jesus why he cannot be well. Why his life is too big of a mess for Jesus to do anything about it. Why he is too broken for anything to be done to fix it. I think sometimes Jesus finds us in those spaces where we feel like we've made such a wreck of our lives that there's no rescuing it. There's no digging us out of it. We're just broken and alone. Consider this. This man would not be able to enter into the full uh, area of worship at the temple because of his disability. Not only because the closer you got to the temple proper, the more steps you had to climb up. Uh, but because the ritual law of Moses excluded him from certain aspects, uh, he certainly could not come into the holy place by any means and uh, was, would likely have been excluded from even the court of Israel. Uh, there were a lot of uh, lame and, and, and sick people who would, who would congregate just outside of that uh, at the gate of Solomon. But he's not at God's house. I wonder if he's lost hope in God doing anything for him. I wonder if he's at this pool of superstition, hoping that maybe something out there will do something. But really, as Jesus interviews him, we find that he really doesn't expect anything good to happen. Not only is he isolated from God, but he's isolated from everybody else. He says, I have no one. I have no one to put me into the pool. Consider the contrast between this man and the other paralytic Jesus healed who had friends who not only carried him to meet Jesus, but when they got there and found that the house was packed and there was no way to get through the door, they climbed on the roof and opened a hole in the ceiling and let, his, let their friend down on ropes for Jesus to do something. That, that paralytic had some friends, had some family, had some people that loved him. This man has no one. And whether it's because of his dour disposition or the whole circumstances that led to him falling into this, uh, whatever the reasons are, nobody apparently wants to have anything to do with this man. He is utterly alone. So to Jesus' question, do you want to be well? His answer is, don't talk to me about impossibilities. I can't be well. I'm broken. I'm messed up. I'm beyond repair. I have a question from this. The man responded to Jesus with utter despair. He was alone and saw no way to be made well. 
Have you ever felt beyond help in your life? And let's finish verses 8 and the first half of 9. Jesus tells him, get up, take your cot, and walk. And immediately the man was healed, and he took up his cot and was walking. We're told in the Gospels that when Jesus was ministering in his hometown of Nazareth, because of the unbelief of the people in Nazareth, because of their hard hearts, Jesus was not able to do many mighty things in Nazareth. I think we read that and sometimes assume that Jesus is limited to act within the scope of our faith. That unless I put my faith in Jesus, he cannot do something spectacular in my life. I think that's mistaken. It is true that there are a lot of things that God chooses to reserve for uh, response to us. There are some things Jesus says only come out with prayer. So there are some things God will only do in response to us speaking to him about them. And there are things that will not happen unless we reach out to God in faith. Salvation is probably the prime example that comes to mind. It is true that faith is our part of the relationship with God that opens us up to tremendous transforming activity of God in our lives. But it's a mistake to assume that we have to take the initiative, that my faith has to precede God's actions in my life. God is not limited by me. This man had no faith. He did not say, yes, Jesus, please help me. He said, Jesus, nobody can help me. And Jesus helped him anyway. He healed him. He fixed one thing that was broken in his life. And one thing that was a barrier to many others. So by healing him, he could now enter the temple courts. He could uh, be restored to fellowship among others. He would not be this uh, dependent on others the way he had been before and would be able to become a, a productive contributor in the society of his day. So he opened a whole lot of avenues of opportunity for him. But I think there were more things wrong with this man than just that he couldn't walk. He doesn't demonstrate faith in God. He is isolated from fellow man. There are things wrong in his soul. There are things wrong in his heart. Jesus doesn't fix everything. But he does one thing that shows this man that he has the power to restore. John loves to describe the miracles of Jesus in his gospel as signs. And the important thing about a sign is that a sign is not the thing in and of itself. A sign represents or indicates or points to the thing itself. If I'm driving up I-35 from Waco to, toward Dallas and I see a sign that says Dallas 72 miles, that sign is not Dallas. That sign just lets me know that I am on the path to arrive at Dallas in 72 miles. Jesus performed signs, which means he's doing something to point us to something greater. What Jesus did in this man's life by restoring what was wrong in his body was merely a token, an indicator. I can fix all of it. I can make you well. There's no indication as the story progresses that the man became a disciple of Jesus. Sadly, apparently the physical healing was all he took away from this. But Jesus is pointing him to the fact that he can make you well. He can fix all that's broken. I have a final question. Even though the man showed no faith at all, Jesus healed him. Why do you think he healed him without faith? I 
I think there are important things we learn from this man. When we hit the end of our own attempts to make life work and we hit a dead end and we hit bottom and find ourselves totally alienated and isolated from God and fellow man, when we're broken in body, mind, and soul, when we're alone in the world and powerless to change our condition, Jesus shows up and asks simply, do you want to become well? He gives us the gift of hope by extending the promise of redemption. Now, it's a whole lot more than what this man experienced. Jesus says, I will restore your broken relationship with the Father. I will reconcile you to your Creator. And in the process, I will begin the process of reconciling you to fellow man. I will bring an end to war in your heart and ultimately in your world. Jesus extends to us the promise of eternal redemption, eternal life. Resurrection and immortality and being brought to full wellness in an eternal capacity. This is the hope he lays before us, this grand and glorious hope. The only question remaining for us is, are we going to receive it? Will we lay claim to it? Do we want to become well? Lord Jesus, we thank you so much for your love. Thank you that even when we have absolutely wrecked and ruined our lives, you don't turn from us in disgust. You don't say you brought this on yourself. You break in and extend to us the hope of promise. Extend to us the question, do you want to become well, God? Give us eyes of faith to see you, to turn to you, and to allow you to make us well. Grant us the trust to surrender our hearts and lives to your care. We love you, Jesus. It's in your name, by your merits, that we pray.